we now have a topology of the two stage op amp which can provide a high gain and of course the input is differential it can take the difference between two inputs the way we realize this is by cascading a single stage op amp which is nothing but a differential pair with a current mirror load biased at a certain tail current i not and the output of this is given to another common source amplifier okay the first stage is biased with a tail current of i0 and the second stage with a current of i2 so by adjusting the w by l ratio of m6 compared to m00 we get a current of i2 okay so we saw how this works and this is the plus terminal of the op amp this is the negative terminal so let's say it's biased at some v bias and we apply a differential input the small signal output assuming that all transistors are in saturation what is that what would it be what will be the small signal output assuming all transistors are in saturation region this is the product of the gains so gm1 by GDS one plus GDS three times GM five by GDS five plus GDS six times VD. Now, of course, the transistors will be in saturation only if you enclose this in a negative feedback loop and choose the correct value of V bias. Okay, but we can do that. So I'll assume that everything is in saturation, and the small signal model of the entire op amp is. this is the model of the first stage it's a differential amplifier and if i call this vo1 sorry the second stage gm5 times vo1 and the output conductance will be gds5 plus gds6 okay now if you have any load resistance connected to the output that will also appear in parallel okay for the calculation of the gain right so if i have some additional load conductance here i'll also get the load conductance in the denominator okay so this is the two stage op amp we also know that there will be parasitic capacitors everywhere really but let's say we mainly model them by a capacitance at the output of the first stage and another load capacitance at the output of the second stage now this if you enclose in a feedback loop you will most likely get a very small damping factor which is undesirable but we also know the fix for this that is using this miller compensation arrangement or pole splitting so we connect cc between the gate and drain of m5 okay these things have been discussed quite in detail in the one of the previous tutorials so you can refer to that and also uh, we can use all the other embellishments like having resistance in series to remove the right half plane zero and so on okay what should be the value of rc do you remember 
without rc there will be a right half plane zero in the transfer function so what's the value of rc huh? no no what's the value of rc it has to have dimensions of resistance yeah where will the right half plane zero be let's say in absence of rc where will be the right half plane zero huh right half plane but where will it be what is the frequency what is the frequency huh gm 1 by cc which one which gm gm 5 it's the stage across which it is connected zero will be at gm 5 by cc and adding this rc will modify the location of the zero and add a third pole so what should be the value of rc so that the zero goes away what was it 1 by with gm 5 yeah so for rc equals 1 by gm 5 the zero disappears but you will have a third pole you can see which is a better trade off and decide to use it or not so again all the calculations of uh, uh, stability choosing the value of cc for a given phase margin and feedback Uh, fraction and so on will be done from the small signal model and those things have already been discussed right at the control source level we have done everything that we need for stabilizing the op amp okay so basically given a feedback loop around this op amp you should be able to find the value of cc i mean given the values of c1 and c2 cl you should be able to find out the cc value of cc such that you get a certain phase margin whatever 60 degrees or 45 degrees or whatever it is okay we are using a most common source amplifier what do you mean yeah so you mean apply the input signal here also not yeah the idea is uh, from the output of the first stage why not use a cmos inverter okay don't bias this at a fixed current but let's say connect it up like that essentially the second stage is cmos inverter will this work will this work or no ha huh? how do we bias yeah so the problem here is that uh, if you use a current mirror bias the second stage current is fixed to i2 okay if you use it like this then let's say you put this in you have to put this in a feedback loop so let's say i connect it up like that vdd by 2 the output will be vdd by 2 okay so if you do that it will get biased there is no problem in getting it to bias if you do this and connect this to vdd by 2 the output will go close to vdd by 2 okay and this will go to what voltage the input of the cmos inverter what will that be now it will be whatever is required to get the output to vdd by 2 the cmos inverter zone characteristic will look like that right okay the output has to be vdd by 2 the input will be whatever is required to get that vdd by 2 because the whole thing is a negative feedback right you can think of the rest of the circuit adjusting this node until this becomes vdd by 2 okay so that it will get biased that's not a problem the problem is what is the current consumed in this second stage it's not fixed and in fact you calculated that right for the self bias condition sometime back you calculated what the current through that is what was the what was the current what was the essential feature what did it depend on vdd actually it had vdd minus vtp minus vtn squared okay so it's a very strong dependence on vdd so that means that the transconductance gm of the second stage varies quite a lot okay so in such a situation first of all the current is uncontrolled that is un itself undesirable if the vdd increases slightly you are burning a lot of current secondly like for instance the stabilization and so on these things work if you know the value of gm it can vary a little bit but if it varies by a large amount 
you have to look at what the worst case is and adjust the stabilizing capacitor CC for that worst case. So, that may be too much of an over design, ok. So, GM 5 will vary by a lo lot, ok. In fact, if you recall the earlier discussion, you know that GM 5 has to be much greater than GM 1, right. It has to be substantially greater than GM 1. Now, in this case, the GM varies with supply, ok. You have to make sure that the smallest such value is much bigger than GM 1 then the larger such value could be unnecessarily large. So, this will work, this will function, but it is not desirable that is all, ok. So, this I assume if I give you the values of all of these things, first of all you can come up with this model. Like I said yesterday, uh, when you are asked for more complicated questions about the op amp like this uh, frequency compensation and so on. It is best if you use the macro model for this whole stage. If you write down the small signal model of this and do it, of course, you can get the answer, but it just becomes too messy every time to do it. So, derive this properly, the macro model of the single stage op amp which is this part and uh, use it wherever necessary, ok. So, that is the easiest way to go about it. And also, ok, and uh, of course, do not get confused by let us say superficial differences in the exam or something. Meaning. Here I have labeled this M1, M2, M3, M4, and the output of M4 is what goes to that. Okay, so it could be. I mean, who knows how it is numbered in uh, whatever circuits you see. Okay, so this is the two-stage op amp. Basically, you should now be able to uh, carry out all the required calculations. Okay, you can find out if I give you the circuit of the op amp and the parasitic capacitors. You should be able to find out the value of CC. Uh, you should first be able to find the model and the DC gain and the value of the capacitor that will stabilize it, the bandwidth of the op amp and so on, ok. Now, as always the uh, stabilizing capacitor CC depends on what feedback loop it is placed in, ok. So, depending on whether we make, by the way, what is the unity gain frequency of the op amp by itself? This one, huh? what is the unity gain frequency of the op amp by itself? that is DC gain times the first pole A naught P 1, what was that? Hmm? The expression for the this again, if you plot the gain magnitude of the op amp, it will have some DC gain that we know it is G M 1 by G D S 1 plus G D S 3 times G M 5 by G D S 5 plus G D S 6 and it will have a low frequency pole because of this Miller effect P 1 and in a well designed op amp it will maintain a slope of minus 20 dB per decade up to and beyond the unity gain frequency ok and after that it will have the second pole and the 0 and so on ok. So, what is the frequency of this omega u assuming it is like this? Yeah, I know what is that? What is the expression for it in terms of uh, the internal model of the op amp? Huh? G m 1 by C c right. The expression for that was actually quite simple it is G m 1 by C c ok. Now, uh, let us say I have an op amp in unity feedback like this, ok. And this op amp is what I showed you earlier, it has a certain G m 1, G m 2 and C c and so on, ok. And this is just the uh, unity gain frequency of the op amp. What will be the unity loop gain frequency here? that is where the loop gain goes to unity, what will that be? What is it? Same, why? K is 1, I mean the feedback fraction is 1, right. So, in this case the loop gain equals the gain of the op amp. So, the unity loop gain frequency is the unity gain frequency of the op amp which is G m 1 by C c and you have to make sure that if you have an application like this the second pole is well beyond this unity loop gain frequency that is what is relevant ok. The unity gain frequency of the op amp itself is not relevant I mean unless you are putting it in the I mean it is not directly relevant ok. Everything will depend on it, 
but when you place it in unity feedback, the unity loop gain frequency will be the same as unity gain frequency of the op amp. If I did this, first of all, what's the what kind of an ampli what kind of an amplifier is this? What should be the ideal output? Two VI. What will be the unity loop gain frequency for this feedback loop? I use the same op amp. In this case, omega u loop is omega u of the op amp divided by 2, which is g m 1 by 2 c c. Okay. And if I have this, what is the ideal output? What should be the output ideally? Huh? Minus 2 V i and what is the unity loop gain frequency here? J m 1 by 2 c c. Yeah. What is the unity loop gain frequency in this case? Find out, I mean calculate it and see. this you break the loop and you go around there is a voltage divider of a fraction 1 by 3 and then a of s so the loop gain is a of s by 3 and the unity loop gain frequency is unity gain frequency of the op amp divided by 3 which is gm 1 by 3 cc. So, you have to make sure that the second pole is placed sufficiently higher than this frequency for this particular circuit. Okay. So, the value of cc does depend on the circuit you are making using the op amp. Of course, sometimes you may be asked just find the value of cc, then you assume unity gain and then move on. If you, nothing else is given to you, it is just assume that you will uh, take the worst case which is unity feedback. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, but you use a smaller value of CC here. You do not need to use the same value of CC there and here, right? If you do, if you have the same value of CC, sure, this will give you a lower bandwidth, okay. But uh, when you are designing an IC, this is not the case. You for the amplifier that you are making, you choose the value of CC. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. When you have freedom to choose CC, there is nothing that says that this has a lower bandwidth than the other one. In fact, you have solved the problem in the tutorial, right? Like you went from gain of one to gain of uh, four or something. I don't remember. And then when you redesign the value of CC, when you recalculate the value of CC, the bandwidth that you got was about the same or even more than the previous case for some by some small amount. Okay. So, it does not say anything, but the other day I was discussing the advantage of this. What was the advantage of this type of configuration? The inverting versus non inverting, I think we had a very brief discussion about that. Ah. What was that? So, the common mode input here swings a lot, right? The common mode input here equals the input signal whereas the common mode input here is nearly 0. Okay. So, that can be a big advantage in some cases. First of all for swing limits and also this large common mode swings induce other kinds of nonlinearities and so on. So, for that also. So, this type is usually what is preferred and yeah there is a disadvantage if you are the, using the same op amp for this and that, but in the context of IC design that is not relevant because in that case you will just use a smaller value of CC and move on. Okay. How? Oh, I mean, uh, so I do not know if you are uh, familiar with the cross section of an IC, there will be a silicon wafer, usually you start with P type and then you make MOS transistors, N MOS will be made like this in the process. For P MOS you first make an N well, 
and you make this, then you will have poly here and to connect it there will be a number of layers of metal. So, you take two layers of metal that is a parallel plate capacitor. Now, the number of layers of metal is quite I mean now it can be 8 or 10. So, you can make lots of capacitors. I see some picture here this looks like the fringing of a capacitor and that is also sometimes used. So, you just make two wires next to each other and there will be fringing. Okay. Now, this works and actually sometimes that can give you a lot of capacitance because when we draw a parallel plate we draw a thin plate like this, but uh, usually when you make a wire on an IC it could even be taller than it is wide. So, the, the area this way like sideways facing area could be more than the area that you look from the top area that you see from the top. But yeah, I mean you bring any two metals close to each other, you can form a capacitor and sometimes for uh, making capacitors there will be a special layer which you can bring very close to another layer. So, that you get a lot of uh, capacitance per unit area. So, we have the two stage op amp and uh, let me call this V i C m to denote that it is the input common mode bias and this is V o. We have to calculate the swing limits and as before we neglect any effect of the differential input on the swing limit right. That was reasonable we found earlier also. Okay. So, effectively we specify two swing limits, one is the common mode swing limit which is specified at the input, what is the range of common mode inputs you can handle and also uh, limit specified on the output, what is the uh, allowable values that V o can take. Okay. So, first the input common mode swing limit, what happens if the input common mode becomes very small, V s m becomes very small which transistor will have trouble? Huh? M 0. Okay. This is exactly the same as in the uh, single stage op amp case right and what is the limit? What is the lower limit on V A C M? What is the lower limit? What is it that you have to leave room for? There is some limit. What will be accommodated in that limit? What is that? V g s of m 1, V d s of m 1, why? V c m is applied to the gate, right. So, I want to say how far V i c m is above ground. Okay. So, what are things that you have to allow for? You need to have enough uh, M 0 should behave like a current source. So, you need to have enough voltage V d s sat that is V g s minus V t across that okay, to keep M 0 in saturation and then M 1 it will be working in saturation and you need enough V g s across that. Okay. So, you have to allow for V g s of M 1 and V d s of M 0. Okay. So, this will be V g s of M 1 at a current of I naught by 2 plus V d sat of uh, m 0 at a current of y naught, which if I expand out I will get V t n plus square root i naught by k n 1 plus square root 2 i naught by k n 0. Okay. Transistors, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, no, strong inversion has got nothing to. That's correct. So we should have 150 millivolts. Where? No, no. Uh, what decides uh, which which is the voltage that decides whether the transistor is in strong inversion or not? No. What is the meaning of strong inversion? VGS. So VGS should be 150 millivolts more than VT. Okay. So that means it will be in strong inversion. Otherwise, it will be in between. Okay. 
So, what happens if I as I increase VACM at what point will some transistor get into trouble? Which one? Which is the transistor that will get into trouble? M5, why? Uh, really? Will that limit the? Will that be influenced by VACM at all? I'm talking about what happens if I go on increasing VACM, which is the transistor that will have trouble. M1 and M2, right? Just like again in the single stage op amp. Remember again, you are, if you assume that these two are perfectly matched, this voltage will be the same as that voltage. That will be VDD minus VSD of M3. Okay. So, if the input crosses this, it's okay, but it shouldn't cross it by more than one threshold voltage, right? So, this effect is because of M0, and the upper limit is because of M1 or M2. Okay. The upper limit will be VDD minus VSG3 at a current of Y0 by 2 plus VTP. Okay. Again, if I expand that out, it will be VDD minus VTN plus VTP minus square root I0 by KP of M3. Yeah. If you leave it like this, if you leave it in open loop uh, and if you assume perfect symmetry, VICM, the common mode input will not, okay. The output does not change with the common mode input. Yeah. Is this okay? I mean, there is nothing new here. Everything I did is exactly the same thing that I did with uh, single stage op amp, okay. Now, as far as the output limits are concerned, what happens? What happens if VO swings very small? Now, again, you have to imagine that this op amp is in closed loop and there is some input that is causing VO not to change, right? Or you imagine some small VD that is causing V not to change. So, V not changes because of change in VD, the input of the op amp. But when it changes, there will be some swings and what will be the, uh, when will the, when will any transistor get into trouble? Let us say when we are not swinging down first. Obviously, M6, right? M6 can go into triode region. And what about upwards? M5. Huh? Is that correct? Yeah. So, that is all. So, actually, now this node will also change, okay, when the signals change. But again, we assume that if we assume that the second stage also has substantial gain, then the variation in this node voltage will be very small. So, we ignore all of that and find the limits of the swing, we should find the swing limits for the op amp. Is this clear? Actually, how will, so let us say V naught is swinging up, what does it mean for this, what was, what would be the incremental voltage here? This voltage should be decreasing for this to go up, right. So, actually this voltage will be decreasing and this will go up and some point this will cross that by 1 VT. What I am saying is we will neglect any change in this because a very small change in this will cause a large change in that one. Okay. So, as far as the evaluation of the swing limits are concerned, we do not have to worry about it. That is all I am saying. Okay. So, again the limits on the total output, what is the lower limit? What is it? It will be basically the saturation voltage of M6 at a current of I2, okay. So, which is 2 times I2 by Kn6. And similarly, on the upper side, sorry, it is VDD minus the saturation voltage of M5 at a current of I2, okay. So, again, this will be VDD minus 2 times. I2 by KP5. Okay. Yes. For stability of the op amp,
we had earlier evaluated that gm 5 has to be greater than gm 1 ok. To get that most uh, frequently you will have to bias I 2 I mean you have to choose I 2 that is bigger than I naught. There is also another reason I have not connected any load yet ok. So, when you connect a load right there is also the possibility of cut off because the load will draw some current as the signal is swinging. So, the bias current in this stage has to be sufficient for that as well ok. Yeah, we could use that, but I mean if you do not use it then uh, uh, that will also come into play I mean that consideration depending on how much the load is you may have to increase it, but in general I 2 will be like say, uh, 3 or 4 times I naught at least if not more. That depends on the size of M 5 I mean if you assume identical sizes for all transistors that is true, but that is also not the case when you. Uh, realize an IC M6 and M5 will be wider than uh, these transistors usually. Okay. So the outputs we have room from zero to VDD. That's where any signal can swing. Okay, at least in circuits that don't have inductors. Then usually in uh, this type of circuits, the best you can do is to come within one saturation voltage of ground and one saturation voltage of VDD. That is what the case here is. This is VD sat 5 and this much is VD sat 6. Okay. Basically that means that if you have an output node there should just be one transistor to VDD and one transistor to ground. If you have more transistors in the path that means that each of them has to be accommodated and the amount of signal swing you get will be smaller for a given supply. Okay. Is this fine? On the input side you cannot help it VICM it is asymmetric right. On the upper side it can go a lot closer to VDD on the lower side it cannot come as close to ground ok. Because if you look at the terms we have a threshold voltage and two overdrive voltages. Let us arbitrarily assume that all transistors have the same threshold voltage and the same overdrive voltages ok. So, if the threshold voltage is 1 volt and 2 I d by k that is the overdrive voltage is half a volt for every transistor you have chosen the sizes such that this happens. Then what is the lower limit? What is it? It is 1 threshold plus 2 overdrives how much is that? 2 volts and so it has to be 2 volts away from uh, ground. On the upper side how much is that? V d d minus half a volt V d will cancel. So, it can go within half a volt of V d d ok. And at the output what happens V naught has to be V d d minus how much half and greater than half a volt. So, it can come within half a volt of either supply ok. So, this is kind of the best you can do. So, that is why this is also a quite a widely used topology ok. and this can be embellished further. So, let us say what is the small signal output resistance of this op amp? Again if you recall the model you will see immediately what is it or small signal output conductance what is that? Yeah. What is it? it is G D S 5 plus G D S 6 and the resistance is the reciprocal of that. So, if you say that that is too large for the load that you are driving you can add a buffer a voltage buffer which is a source follower you can add NMOS or PMOS I am showing an NMOS buffer ok. Again you can make a model for this by itself you know what that is and you can analyze it you can put the parasitic capacitors you will have extra poles and so on. Finally, uh, none of this part changes you will still do it in the same way ok. Is this fine? Yeah. 
Yeah, it is a buffer. If you want to drive a very heavy load, you will need a buffer. Okay. So, this also you should be able to, I mean again use a model for this stage and this stage and this stage, then you will be able to figure out uh, given the parasitic capacitors how much CC should be, what the phase margin will be, all of these things. Okay. Huh? Well, yeah, I mean depends on how much parasitic it adds here and what load is there, right. I mean CC will be uh, evaluated based on all the poles in the circuit. Now, you will have an extra pole, right, you will have an extra stage. So, if you connect a capacitor here, there will be a capacitor there. So, there will be at least three poles in the system, okay. So, it will affect it in that way. So, any time you add a stage, you will add at least one pole, if not more. Yeah, it will be right, because this point still can swing by whatever we uh, saw earlier and this can only swing less than that, right, because on the upper side, you need to have another VGS. So, this will, this is actually poor as far as swing limits are concerned. So, that kind of concludes the or almost finishes the two stage op amp. Now, one more thing I have to discuss is this. So, let me copy, oops. Let me copy over this part. Now, this is the op amp and then we know that there is some, uh, there are some limits for V i C m, okay. So, let me call them V a and V b and there are some limits for V o, let me just call them V c and V d, okay. So, now let us say I make a unity gain buffer, you could take any other amplifier that is also fine. First, I will start with a unity gain buffer. Now, I have to choose some operating point value here, okay. How will I choose that? What is that? So, basically first of all this uh, in this particular case, the output is also V i bias and if I apply some incremental signal, nearly the same thing will also appear at the output, okay. So, always you have to, I mean in general you choose the bias, so that you can apply the largest swing that is possible. Now, in case of an op amp, you have to look at uh, the total signal and compare it to the common mode swing limit as well as the output swing limit. Obviously, in case of the uh, unity gain uh, follower, either of them can limit the signal swing, okay. So, you have to choose V bias such that it is within this and also within that one, okay. And typically, I mean, because V O can swing wider, this is what will limit for case uh, for the uh, uh, voltage follower. Okay. So that part is fine. Now, if you look at uh, the earlier discussions we had on op amp circuits, and also in books and so on, which uh, you may have read, you just have V I and V O without any mention of bias. Okay. How is that? And in fact, in the lab also, you may have done this. So, you do not show the bias with op amp circuits, right? Just say V i and then the output will be V o or k times V o or something. No. So, there is still a bias, but not in this way. So, like I said, you have to choose a bias. And one possibility is let us say V d d by 2 or something, so that you just bias it in the middle and the output can swing equally on both sides, okay. The same thing you will do for uh, this also. Yeah, so that depends on the uh, circuit. V d d by 2 is a convenient thing to use. For instance, I draw a picture like this, right. V i and V o, this is the classic uh, inverting amplifier, okay. So, what is the input common mode voltage here? 0. 
So, will this work? Is the input common mode of 0 within the acceptable range for us? For our op amp, does this range include 0? Clearly not. In fact, the lower limit is some positive value. So, you have to also choose some V bias here. That is, you have to lift up the ground by a certain amount V bias. So, that what is the input common mode voltage now? V bias. So, you have to make sure that that it is in the correct range. Okay. Now, what happens in uh, the lab and so on is that the op amp is. So, the way we are operating the op amp, this is V D D and this is V bias and this is also at V bias. Okay. This is an inverting amplifier. What will be the output voltage? No, what is it? What will it be? Also V bias. Okay. So, the op amp is now simply biased at V bias and if I apply a signal V bias plus V i, this will be V bias minus R 2 by R 1 times V i. Okay. This is what is known as a single supply operation of the op amp, okay. meaning we just have a single supply voltage between the positive and negative terminals of the op amp. Okay. Now, what happens in the lab in the usual conditions is that, I mean we have to have a source for V bias also. This is a problem with uh, DC coupling everywhere. So, we will have a source V bias. Okay. Now, of course, uh, selection of ground is arbitrary, right? You can call anything the ground. Okay. So then, let me call this. Let me redefine this as uh, zero volts. What will be this voltage? <laughs> Minus V bias and this one V D D minus V bias. So basically, if I redraw that. All that is happening is that this is called ground, but the op amp is operated with two supplies. Okay. This is according to our terminology V D D minus V bias and this is minus V bias. Okay. Now, usually you simply call this maybe plus V C C and minus V E or something like that. Okay. So, it is operated with a dual supply with this at ground. So, that is why in the lab you make circuits with uh, 0 quiescent voltage. Okay. The circuits are exactly the same. There is no ground inside the op amp. Okay. So, if I show it like this, in MOS ICs, it is common to show it as the bottom rail is ground and the upper rail is a supply. Then I have to provide a bias here. I still have two sources. Okay. And if you use the usual convention for the op amp, there will be two supplies for the op amp and the input bias will be 0 and that has its own conveniences. You do not have to worry about bias every time. Okay. Because if this is minus V e and if this is plus V c c, both the common mode and the output swing limits will be somewhere within that, which will include 0. Okay. So, it is just that you operate an op amp with a dual supply, so that 0 is part of the swing limits, that is all. Okay. Sign of the? Yeah. So, actually this is V bias. That is clear and this is what you will be doing in the lab, but you have to I mean there is really a bias. Okay. The bias value is 0 because you call this voltage 0, but you have a negative supply for the op amp as well. But if uh, in some cases you may have to use a single supply for the op amp, then uh, uh, then you will have to have some bias here like I showed in this case. Okay. Any questions about the two stage op amp? No, I mean, yeah, you can add a buffer and that is about it. You can make a three stage op amp and it will have a more complicated compensation scheme. But 
but lot of that is kind of engineering detail and if you come to analog IC design you can see some of that. Okay, so that finishes the transistor level discussion of op amps. I think uh, one of the things I had advertised at the beginning of the course is that you will know what is inside the op amp and this is what is inside and it is not only I mean you do not just look at the picture you should be able to carry out calculations involving this okay and it is no more difficult than any two stage op amp you can have uh, also in the negative feedback you can have instead of this type of stuff multiple inverters in cascade all kinds of things for everything the principle is the same okay. Uh, you have to make sure that the dominant pole of the uh, loop gain is low enough so that up to the unity gain lo unity loop gain frequency and a little bit beyond that you will have a first order roll off that is all.